Hello, uh, this is Russ Glasgow, and I'm going to be talking with you this morning about our REAIM framework. And my goal is in the next five to seven minutes to tell you about 20 years of research involving the uh, history, uh, current uh, focus, and uh, some of our future directions on REAIM. As you can see on this uh, first slide here, uh, we're going to talk about the purpose of REAIM uh, when it was first developed, some key issues that we're now exploring and emphasizing, including context, use of REAIM for planning, adaptations, cost, and uh, use of REAIM to enhance transparent reporting. Uh, there are too many colleagues that have been involved in our REAIM team, both nationally and locally, uh, to mention individually, but you can see the, the names that are uh, listed here who've been uh, just key partners in here. I'll call your attention particularly to the very first reference there that's now in press in front chairs of public health. Uh, it should be published any week, and I call it to your attention because it covers much of the same issues that I'm going to today, but, but much more in depth. So let's start with the beginning. As I said, REAIM was developed 20 years ago this year. Uh, it was intended from its outset to facilitate translation of research into practice and policy. And in particular, it focused on giving greater attention to external validity, the generalizability and representativeness, not to do away with or de-emphasize internal validity, but to try and achieve a better balance. REAIM has both individual level factors that focus on the end user, the patient, or the citizen. Uh, those, the R and the E, stand for reach and effectiveness. The AIM factors, adoption, implementation, and maintenance, uh, are at the setting level, and often setting itself is multi uh, level. For example, interventions are nested, let's say, within uh, medical clinics, which are nested within health systems, which are nested within communities. And uh, one of the take home points about REAIM is that the bottom line public health impact depends on all elements, or essentially you can think of it as a multiplicative relationship among all the elements, not just effectiveness, as uh, many models focus on. Uh, more recently, uh, our team, and particularly Paul Estabrooks and I, uh, have focused on what we call pragmatic use of REAIM. And what we mean by that is rather than expecting uh, users to use every aspect of REAIM and to comprehensively assess and try to uh, enhance or maximize all of them, that we work with stakeholders to figure out their priorities and what's most important for them. Uh, given a particular setting, uh, state of the research, and uh, just uh, local situation. And what we've tried to do is change the technical definitions uh, into something that's more usable, friendly, for say, clinical and community uh, users. So a quick example, REACH, the technical definition of REACH is the proportion, representativeness, and reasons uh, why individuals uh, who are eligible individuals are uh, reached to participate, uh, begin participation. But for our community users, we've tried to translate that into a more user-friendly who, what, why, where, how. So it's the notion of who's intended to benefit and who actually participates, or in the case of a policy, is exposed to the uh, intervention. So a brief history of REAIM, uh, it has evolved quite a bit over time. It's one of the most frequently used uh, frameworks in implementation science, and uh, it has been used uh, quite a bit. It's also one of the most frequently used models for grant applications to NIH and CDC. A second take home point is that REAIM has been used successfully both for planning as well as evaluating interventions. And now we're uh, looking at uh, iterative use of REAIM to help guide adaptations. Still, though, not all has gone well in applying REAIM. And from literature reviews that we've done in multiple areas, 
we find that there's underreporting of certain elements of REAIM, and those key elements that are often uh, at least uh, well reported having to do with adoption and maintenance. Uh, focusing on the right hand area, some of the new areas uh, that we're excited about uh, incorporating into REAIM have to do with cost and resources and adaptations that are made. Um, and secondly, we're focusing much more on qualitative measures. The REAIM historically has been used descriptively and quantitatively. And then, uh, in some ways, most exciting, the star at the top, and as shown, uh, exploded on the next figure, focus on context. Uh, we're, we're really uh, doing this, and primarily through, you can see at the bottom, what we call our PRISM extension of REAIM. And PRISM stands for Pragmatic, Robust Implementation and Sustainability Model. And at the top are the key PRISM uh, contextual factors that you probably can't quite see, but like many uh, DNI models, it, it has external and internal uh, context. Uh, the internal context, again, has this clear multi-level focus on the characteristics uh, priority and history of both recipients and the individuals within an organization that's uh, the setting for uh, an intervention. And in particular, it has one semi-unique factor that we call the implementation and sustainability infrastructure. More generally, and moving to the center of the figure, you can see our reach dimensions organized around the circle. And then at the top of the center is the evidence-based intervention or intervention, key intervention components we talk about. On the bottom part of the circle there is the implementation strategies or the how that the evidence-based intervention is delivered. Um, a couple other key take-home uh, issues about REAIM and this new figure we have are on the left hand and the right hand are rectangles there. Uh, specifically on the left hand, the key point is that the success of an intervention depends on the combination and the fit or alignment among the intervention, the implementation strategies, the context, and then the re-aim uh, outcome dimensions. It's not just one or even two of those, but it's the fit among all of those. And finally, over on the right-hand side, the overarching issues that cut across all of these dimensions, as you hopefully can see, have to do with the proportion or penetration of eligible settings or individuals, their representativeness from an equity perspective, reasons how and why these results are achieved, and then this notion, again, of adaptations and cost or benefit. Finally, um, we aim will continue to evolve. Uh, we're not sure exactly how, but some of the most likely ways that uh, it will uh, morph are to be used, especially for comparative effectiveness research, and as I mentioned before, more iterative use of REAIM to guide adaptations during the delivery of a project. We're now focusing and will even more on the use of REAIM to enhance transparent reporting that we think can uh, help address the replication crisis in many areas of uh, science uh, through what we call our expanded consort model. And finally, one possible direction that we're just starting to work on is either integrating, using together, or even merging REAIM with the Precis II model of pragmatism. So that concludes my brief presentation. Thank you very much uh, for listening. And again, uh, I, uh, my team and I welcome uh, your ideas and feedback.